I saw the Great Pyramids of Giza for the first time when I was four years old. My dad took me to show me what was possible on this land. These are gigantic structures. I distinctly remember looking up and being in total awe. And at the time, I was maybe like three feet tall, so they absolutely towered over me. I asked my dad right away, which means, can I climb to the top? And he said, which means, absolutely not. And in that moment, I remember thinking, when I'm older, I'm going to climb this pyramid. For years after that, every single time I saw the pyramids, which is a lot when you live near Cairo, I always thought about climbing them, especially Khufu, the tallest of the three. You have to understand, I'm a huge dreamer, head in the clouds sort of dude, and I've always been this way. I believe I can reach for more than what's been handed to me. My hope is what directs the decisions I make. It's really the core of who I am. If I didn't have hope, I would have never left my father's farm in Egypt. Hope is what grounded me in believing I could forge my own path. During the Arab Spring, <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people protested against oppressive governments, using social media to organize and share information. I was studying in South Africa at the time, so I had to watch it from afar via YouTube and Facebook as my people took to the streets. President Mohammed Hosni Mubarak has decided to waive the office of the President of the Republic. That experience solidified my dream of using social media as a tool to wield positive change, just like my heroes in the revolution. It's what eventually gave me the drive to leave the continent and attend college across the world. 16 years after that first visit to the Great Pyramid, I was an undergraduate student in Canada, studying how storytelling, technology, and media connect. But even when I knew that Egypt had made some progress, global news coverage couldn't have seemed darker. Visitors to the famous Giza pyramids, once a huge draw for American tourists, have all but disappeared. Gas lines are hours long. The country is basically not functioning. I mean, there's no security. The media depicted the new Egyptian regime as incapable claiming that the Arab Spring had largely failed. But I still believed in the power of our people. I mean, would once created the freaking pyramids and would overthrow the government. If we could do that, then we could do anything, right? And that's when it hit me. The plan was simple. I would climb Giza, capture it on a GoPro, and tell the story. To hopefully change what Egypt stood for in the eyes of people all around the world. Most importantly, it would remind people at home of what was possible. I am not a dream and do nothing kind of guy. So I put my plan right into action. And if this trip was going to happen, I wanted some company. Luckily, I knew just who to ask, my friend Oscar. We first met at soccer tryouts at my university, but we ultimately ended up connecting over our dreams of becoming entrepreneurs. When I showed up at his doorstep with this ridiculous pitch of climbing the biggest pyramid in the world, he didn't blink, he was in. This trip home had more than just my dream of climbing the pyramid riding on it. It also felt like it might be the last opportunity for me to travel in and out of Egypt for a while. Because here's the thing. Egypt requires the firstborn son to opt in for military service. And as the firstborn son in my family, I only got a pass because I was studying abroad. So as I checked off year after year of college, the weight of my military service got heavier and heavier. Our trip to Egypt would last 38 days. On the first day, we suited up, hopped in the car, and headed into Cairo. But when we got there, every government official we talked to laughed at us. They were like, that's never going to happen. But just like I hadn't accepted my dad's absolutely not all those years ago, I wasn't prepared to take no for an answer. Not on day one, two, three, until day 37. That's when we had our first breakthrough. Ladies and gentlemen. That's Oscar. We just came out of the Supreme Council of Antiquities and we got the paper officially climbing the pyramids. It's been a journey. We got our signatures it's on it. It's been a dream, man. Oh. It's been a dream, but we're climbing tomorrow, baby. The night before the climb, I didn't sleep. I was so excited. This was everything I wanted my whole life. I could not believe it was finally happening. 
We got up early, drove to the pyramids, official papers in the glove box, but when we made it to the entrance. Muhammad Bihamud, I don't know the topic. Stay in the car. The head of security was not having it at all. We were the very first people with the legal permission to climb. We had signatures and paperwork and everything, but it didn't matter. The guard would not let us up, which meant we were completely out of luck. Totally fine, I thought. I'd just come back in a few months for summer break and try again, with hopefully a friendlier guard on duty. But the following summer, the entire Egyptian government was shuffled around and our permissions became completely useless overnight. Still, this flicker of hope inspired me to talk about Giza again and again. And in fact, that's exactly how I connected with Thomas and eventually Matt too. Fast forward a couple of years and now I'm in the States. Instead of returning home to complete my mandatory military service, I left school and chosen to build Yes Theory which basically means I can't go home for four more years. Otherwise, if I do, I won't be able to leave until I'm 30. Beyond the painful reality of not seeing my home and my family for years, my plan to climb the Great Pyramid of Giza was simply out of the question. But one day, Matt burst through my apartment door with an idea. I know how to get you to the biggest pyramid in the entire world. I laughed. Matt already knew the story of how I'd been there, tried that. And I just explained, I was like, the biggest pyramid in the world is not in Egypt. It's a common misconception. It's in fucking Guatemala. <laughs> it was called La Danta. And when Matt told me about it, my hope that I would climb the Great Pyramid of Giza morphed into something else altogether. I was going to climb La Danta with Matt and Thomas by my side. I'm exhausted. I slept probably 30 minutes yesterday. Matt, Thomas, me, and a badass crew of filmmakers hiking to the Lost Pyramid in Guatemala. It is the fi final hour of the day. Gotta say, my feet are kind of on fire. We started at 5 a.m. this morning and it is now 5 p.m. That makes it 12 hours. <laughs> that makes it 12 hours of hiking. Who does that? Let's just say it was more physically and emotionally challenging than we expected. The third and final day was the hardest but we were finally going to reach the top of the largest pyramid in the world. So are we good to go up? Yeah, you gotta be good. All right, guys, the moment is upon us. We're actually doing it. What? Wow. This is way bigger than I expected. You can't even grasp it fully in your mind how this huge was... this must have looked when it was for real, you know? Got chills right now. We did it. We climbed the tallest pyramid in the world. Realizing my childhood dream in a way I could have never imagined brought up a lot of emotions. I missed my dad and Egypt, but I also would not want to be anywhere else in the world. The truth is, hope by itself isn't enough. We need to act on it. But how do we act on our hope when our dreams are outside of the path that has been paved for us? From Hatspace Studios, I'm Mark and Deal. I'm Thomas Bragg. And I am Matt Daher. We'll get back to it right after the break. When you're properly hydrated, you just have more energy. It's simple. But if you're like me, it's probably tough to get the recommended glasses of water per day. For those of you familiar with us, you know that one of our essential tools for this is Liquid IV. Liquid IV is the fastest, most efficient way to stay hydrated. Mixing it into your water multiplies your hydration, helping you get as much as double or triple the intake. It's our favorite product to travel with when the world allows for that. We even drank it in a recent trip to Death Valley. It was over 130 degrees Fahrenheit and our bodies were burning through water, literally. I've also been playing a lot of paddle tennis lately and the first thing I do after I come back from practice is rehydrate with liquid IV. Not only do I get the water I need, but liquid IV also has five essential nutrients so that I can start recovering from my workouts instantly. It has more vitamin C than an orange and as much potassium as a banana. The reason liquid IV works so well is that it has an optimal ratio of glucose, sodium, and potassium to deliver water and nutrients to your bloodstream. The ingredients in liquid IV are non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, dairy-free, and soy-free. There's no guesswork here. 
It's just clean, delicious hydration. The next time you go to fill up your water bottle, top it off with Liquid IV and get back to your activity more hydrated than ever. Liquid IV is available nationwide at Walmart, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code YESTHEORY at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you use promo code YESTHEORY at liquidiv.com. Get better hydration today at liquidiv.com, promo code YESTHEORY. Hope is the guiding value in my life, but that doesn't mean it's straightforward optimism. It's messy. The question I've been grappling with my whole life is, how do I hold myself accountable to turn my hope into reality? Especially when the world is telling me that I can't. Our guest today, actress Dina Shehavi, is also navigating how her hope for her future collides with societal expectations. So we tried to do this before and we had technical difficulties because Dina was across the Atlantic and now she's back in New York. So we're going to try to do this again. We just had too much good, strong energy between us, Ahmad. Exactly. We... <laughs> it was just like really overpowered the, the actual connection. And the... Two extremely uh, positive people just <laughs> broke the internet. Dina is best known for her role as Hanin in the Amazon original Jack Ryan, but I prefer to think of her as my friend. Her dreams are my dreams, and my dreams are hers. Let me tell you how we met. So, here's the story. A lot of my friends have been asking if I had seen this show called Rami, and I kept saying no because I usually don't watch a lot of things. But at some point, I end up really getting into it because the show was about a first-generation Egyptian-American Rami, the character, who was navigating the duality of his identity being Middle Eastern, Arab, Muslim, Egyptian, but also growing up in America. And there's a particular scene when Rami goes on a date with this lovely girl, and there's a monologue that gets delivered at the end by this brilliant actress. And uh, the actress is Dina Shehavi. I'm like in this little Muslim box in your head, and I'm the wife or the mother of your kids, right? After the episode ended, I decided to reach out and I said, hey, um, I see you. I love you for what you've done and for representing uh, people who don't necessarily get represented. And I, I just would love to meet you. And not too long after, we went on a bike ride and we just like talked for hours. And so I'd like to welcome you, Adina, to our podcast. We're actually talking about hope. And I'm really excited because you're someone who's given me so much hope. Oh, thank you. That all means so much to me. The question that I like just love asking people is what makes you feel like a free child? Connecting to my joy. And what is it that can bring you back to that joy? I was a really quiet child until when I was 11. I was taken into a dance class and that was like the freest I'd ever felt. And so to me, when I think about like being free, I think of dancing. I want to dig back into your life a little bit and kind of get to understand more uh, your upbringing and your makeup because you've lived all over the world. So uh, yeah, why don't you give us kind of like the rundown of Dina Shehabi? I was born in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia and my father is Saudi, Palestinian, Norwegian. And then my mother is half Palestinian, half German, Haitian. So I'm very mixed. And then we went to Dubai when I was seven because when I was six, they made it illegal for girls to play sports in school. My family made a decision like, all right, do we want to raise our daughter in Saudi? And then when I was 11, I walked into this dance class Within a year, I was dancing professionally, which was hard for my dad, you know, hmm. culturally. You know, a lot of his friends were telling him to be careful. Do you really want your daughter to be, you know, a loose girl? God bless my mother. She was like, we're not going to get in the way of Dina doing this. When Dina was 14, she moved for a third time to Beirut. She had no choice but to leave her dance company behind. I had to find other creative outlets, and that's when I started focusing on acting. While she was a badass professional dancer, Dina always held a dream that she'd become an actress. I would do Oscar speeches in my mirror like, as like a nine-year-old, but I wow. never thought I could ever become an actor because of my voice. People thought her voice was too loud and too high-pitched. 
And remember, Dina was only 14 at this point. And 14-year-olds, well, they can be mean. Like I would get these like emails being like, this is Dina. And it was like a picture of Minnie Mouse and just all of these like awful things that I would say hi and people would like jump back and be like, why do you talk like that? And Arabs will just tell it. Arabs are the worst. Yeah. yeah. They're, just like, <laughs> they just... they're like, Dina, like what's the Sultic? You know what I mean? Like you're speaking too loud and it's like too high. and just like, shut up basically. Luckily, there was one person that told her to ignore her peers and go after acting with the same tenacity that she put towards dance. My acting teacher was like, I know you want to be a dancer, but you have a natural talent. And so then I moved to New York. And I would take acting classes during the day and dance classes at night. And I started taking more acting classes and then decided to audition for Juilliard and NYU's grad acting program. And I got into both. Dina was the first Middle Eastern born woman to be accepted to both the Juilliard and NYU acting programs. She chose NYU. The more and more I acted, the more and more I felt like, oh wait, this, this really feels like my thing. But then she hit a roadblock. Once she graduated... I was really bad at auditioning when I first came out of school. So after I blew this one audition in LA and had a nervous breakdown, and I was like, oh my God, I'm bad at this, you know? Dina still got some acting roles here and there, but each bad audition chipped away at her hope just like the kids who made fun of her voice, until... A ping pong session with my agents at the time where we went and he kicked my ass at ping pong and he recommended that I start writing. He was like, you must have all these stories from where you're from. You've had a really, you know, singular experience. Try writing. He had told me, write three pages and send it to me. This was the first time that I sat down and really put pen to paper. I was writing a role for myself and I wrote a full drama pilot in a week. And I sent him 65 pages. And he called me so excited. And he was like, this is actually really good. You know, I grew up watching Friends and I was like, you know, I'd be the Rachel and my friend would be the Monica. And I always would make a joke, like, when is there ever gonna be like, you know, Adina or an Ahmad and like, you know, white people in North Carolina are like, I'm the Ahmad and you're the Dina and like relating to us in the same way we've related to them. And so it's been a dream of mine for a long time. So I had this story that I've been kind of putting together that I knew was going to be like three women and I knew they were all going to be different nationalities, like one's from Palestine, one's from Morocco and one's from the Khalij. And I wanted that mix of different Arabs and what it feels like to live in America knowing that you're never going to move back to Dubai or Saudi. That's a crazy feeling. Mm -hmm. Like you're never going to go home to the place you're from and not because you don't love it, but it's because what you want from the world, what you're after, America offers. Yeah. America's pretty incredible in that way. It has a lot of problems, so it is everywhere. But at the end of the day, I would not be who I am anywhere else in the world. America is a place where you can go and really succeed. One thing that is really part of the thesis of the show is America is this place of hope, but also it's like lonely here in a way that it isn't back home. And there are parts of back home that I'm constantly trying to, you know, emulate in my life in America. Um, That feeling of family and loyalty and connection and everyone has your back. That's, those are really beautiful Arab qualities. Um, which is why, you know, you and I connect so fast. We're like best friends in five minutes. Like it's honoring the complexities of what it means to be battling with these two sides and wanting both ultimately. After Dina started writing, she found her voice. And once she stopped caring about making it, she made it. She got a leading role in the Amazon Prime original, Jack Ryan. I just knew I was going to get it. It was really weird. I was like, oh shit, this is my part. And then I got it. It is so interesting to think of it all in the framework of hope, because I really think that is genuinely what drives all of my decisions, because to have hope, you have to believe. And I really think I believe that if I work my ass off, I'll do it. I was a terrible dancer before I became like one of the best dancers. I couldn't speak without being embarrassed of my voice before I got into these incredible programs and and I have this really strong sense that 
all right, I'll fucking work my ass off and I'll be able to do it, even if I don't think I can right now. And there's a lot of like growing pains that comes to that. As the show's premiere grew closer and closer, Dina had to garner the courage to reveal a secret she'd been hiding from her parents. But before she shares what happened, we're going to take a quick break. This podcast is produced by Headspace Studios. Headspace has thousands of hours of meditation content. The best tool you have is your mind, so take care of it. We're known for trying all sorts of food challenges at Yes Theory, and our editors even host the world's greatest cooking show. But the truth is, we eat out a lot, and so at the beginning of quarantine, we struggled to cook for ourselves. It's so hard to consistently source and prep great food that's both delicious and good for you. So when you run out of ideas, turn to Green Chef. Green Chef is a USDA certified organic company that makes eating well easy and affordable with plans to fit every kind of lifestyle. They make it so easy to eat well and eat delicious food. Green Chef's expert team designs flavorful recipes that suit your lifestyle and dietary restrictions. They have an incredible variety of high quality clean ingredients. So we feel great about what we're eating and we feel good about how the food got to our table. Green Chef is the most sustainable meal kit and they offset 100% of its direct carbon emissions and plastic packaging in each box. You get your box and everything is so simple. The recipe instructions are so easy to follow that you'll be eating in no time. Go to greenchef.com slash yestheory80 and use code yestheory80 to get $80 off across four boxes, including free shipping on your first box. As you might know, our mental health is a huge priority at Yes Theory. We lean on one another, sharing our highs, lows, and fears too. But sometimes you need a little backup. So imagine having a personalized, judgment-free support system available 24-7 for as little as $65 a week. I'm talking about Talkspace Online Therapy. Talkspace Online Therapy lets you connect with a licensed therapist for a fraction of the price of an in-person therapist. Match with your perfect therapist from the comfort of your device and reach out 24-7. You can message your therapist anytime, then you'll get daily responses five days a week. Just knowing that someone is out there listening and supporting can be hugely helpful amidst everything that's been happening this year. Talkspace's therapist network is highly extensive. For any issue you may need support with, they have thousands of licensed therapists experienced in treating depression, anxiety, substance abuse, trauma, relationship issues, and eating disorders. The bottom line is that we all need someone to talk to. Talkspace wants to give us the support we deserve at a price we can afford. As a listener of this podcast, you get $100 off your first month on Talkspace. To get started, go to Talkspace.com or download the app. Make sure you use the code YESTHEORY to get $100 off your first month. Again, the website is Talkspace.com and you get $100 off by using the code YESTHEORY. I don't know, my life changed when I got that show. No doubt, Dina's role on Jack Ryan was her big break, but it was also the big breaking point between her aspirations as an actress and her family's expectations. Accepting the part required Dina to act in a sex scene, which is quite possibly the most contentious decision a Muslim Arab actress can make. With hope, you get slapped in the face sometimes. It's really complicated, obviously, and, um, I've never actually talked about it publicly, but it was crazy because, I mean, he was devastated. Both my parents were and felt betrayed. And I I was so scared to tell them I'd made this decision to like do the sex scene. And, you know, and I think there was a part of me that also felt that deep shame that I grew up with. And then I basically like sprung it on them like last second and it was mm. not fair and, um they really had to process it while the show was coming out and we had to process it as a family while it was like out in the world and it was really difficult it was like the hardest thing i've ever had to go through you know this armad when a woman does something it reflects more on her father and her brothers than it does on her the older i get the more i acknowledge like the complexities of our culture and like how difficult that is and how certain things that hold women back also hold men back because their reputation rides on what I do. Hmm. And when I made that decision to do it, like the shame I felt as Dina met the shame of the character in this really profound way for me hmm. that it felt important. Hmm. But at the same time, I don't think anything's worth 
devastating your family. This was one of the first stories Dina shared with me when we met up at the beach. We sat down and I basically said, you know, tell me your story and you told me what's happening with your dad. For those of you who do not know, three years ago, my dad gave me an ultimatum. Find another job or come back to Egypt immediately. If you don't do that, then I won't accept you as my son or in my life at all for that matter. You've caused so much harm for your family and relatives. Shame on you. Wake up before it's too late. I won't accept any other outcome except for what I stated above. And while every one of his requests came from a place of love, I ultimately decided that I have the right to determine the life I want to live. I didn't need to live somebody else's dream, even my father's. But I didn't just make that decision once, I make it every day. I choose hope by pursuing my dream with yes theory, and I hold on to the hope that one day he'll come around. And that's what I shared with Dina. I was like, wow, you know, I just went through something with my father, which was really painful. And it was really nice to connect because I actually hadn't spoken to anyone that had upset their father so much that they stopped talking to them. After Dina's father learned of her decision, he stopped talking to her for a couple of months, which felt like a long time since they usually spoke every day. And I know yours has been years, but we really connected on how scary that is, but also what it is to be who we are and what we're exploring and how meaningful that is. And hearing your story just really solidified so much for me because, you know, it's not just my family. I think I was also really touched by you existing as who you are in the world, that a person from my world is as open and vulnerable as you are. That made me feel so proud. And the fact that you're this public figure and inspiring people, no matter where they're from, that made me feel so proud. And I thought, wow, something's happening. Because if you exist and I exist, there are many different versions of us. I swear that was exactly the, what, the thought that came to my mind when I met you, when I, yeah. when I watched Ryan. I was like, oh my God, there's so many more of us. And of course, I'm not the only one. And hearing your story and kind of really getting to see a path where maybe one day my dad will understand, you know, maybe one day he'll be able to see a different perspective to what I do. I think everything that your father wanted to do, you're doing. Like maybe he had a dream that he wanted to leave Egypt. Maybe he wanted a dream to do something else and you're extending it. And inshallah, if you want to have kids, like your kids extend that and they do things like beyond what you expected of them. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really beautiful thing that with each step, we're like taking each other further through this wild ride. I feel invested in your story and wanting you to like have this reconciliation with your father. Like I imagine even like flying to Egypt and being a part of it in some way, like making <laughs> it happen. I'm okay. really charming. Like, I know. And he would love you. He would My love dad me. would love you. Oh, of course. That would be the best part of this story if we got to do that together. And I genuinely, mm. I'm not just saying that for the sake of it, like I feel invested in, in, mm. you, in, in your well-being because I heard your story. And inshallah, that's what we do for each other because I inshallah. really think we can like be each other's family. Every Eid al-Adha, my family gathers over extravagant meals that have been passed down for generations. They exchange gifts, play games, and tell the same stories year after year. At sunrise, my family will join people from all over our town in public prayer, before my father sacrifices a sheep which I would normally help him with. He'll divide the animal in thirds, sending portions to relatives and those in need, before keeping the rest for our family. Eid al-Adha is a time when my whole family comes together, which is one of the many reasons that I stay up late every year to call home. When no one answers, I usually send a voice memo with a common prayer that we say that day. But this year, he picked up for the first time ever for Eid two days really? ago. Wow, really? It's 52 seconds, but I'll, I'll take that any day. It's very, very brief. And, but I think I, at least I got to hear his voice. And that was the first time in like almost three years. Yeah, I, I actually, it feels like I haven't even gotten to process that yet. But um, definitely made me happy to you know, to hear his voice. Wow, that's really beautiful. I think hope is actually most effective when it's least convenient. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Hope is actually survival for some people. Yes, and I think that is a quality of us 
being from the Arab world where it, there's a lot of that energy, like a yeah. lot of excitement and hope because you need it. Yeah. And I'll never give that up. Me and my friend Ratana and a group of our friends, we'd always say this thing like fucked and blessed where like we're <laughs> fucked because we have to deal with this culture, but we're also really blessed mm -hmm. because like that's who we are. There is a part of me that wishes I was like a European girl and could just like do whatever the fuck I wanted, mm -hmm. honestly, because there's a freedom in that as an actor that I really envy. Everything I do, I have to second guess because of where I come from. And I have the most westernized parents that like ultimately still love me after making a decision like that. That's mm -hmm. huge. That's a oh. huge thing. You know, other parents from where we're, where we're from wouldn't have, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm also dealing with like best case scenario. Mm. I have a point of view. I have something to say and it's because of those things. And yeah. being who I am is in constant contradiction. And so I push it too far. I take a step back. I push it further. I take a step back. Is me learning who I am and what I can do because honestly I don't have a reference of someone like me making these mistakes or making these choices whether they're mistakes or not and so that really feeds into my dreams like I grew up wanting to be able to go beyond what was expected of me what was expected of me from my parents from my peers and so I'm pushing that and I'm not gonna make the best choice every time for everyone but that's my way of moving through the dark and creating like shapes and light and it's messy what makes dina's life story so captivating is that it's hers and hers alone she authors each chapter based on what feels uniquely true for her dina certainly didn't start with a blank page but still she refused to become a side character in her own life growing up i don't think anyone would have blinked if I never did anything, if I just married someone. I think that would have been seen as okay. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's almost more expected from someone like me than doing what I'm doing, even though the result has been an outpouring of like love and support and excitement. And I think it's changed because when I look around at all my Arab friends, some of them are fucking incredible actresses. Some are incredible designers. Some are directing. We've all kind of made this shift together. So I think it's really our generation that is in the workforce in this real way. And I think men have more pressure in the Middle East to be successes and to be the breadwinners because culturally they're the ones that provide and take care of the family. So it's okay if you don't want to do anything as a woman, but as a man, you have to be exceptional. You have to make as much money or more money than your father. And that's a lot of pressure. And I actually feel, I feel for men in that way, where I think because no one was forcing me to become an investment banker, I got to do what I wanted. Um, whereas for m men, they are expected to go get terminal degrees in a way that, you know, I wasn't, I know that's kind of controversial to say so, but I really, I think that pressure on men
doing this thing and it's not always going to be comfortable and we're going to figure it out together. When was the last time you felt seen? Not just as you are now, but as your wildest dreams aspire to be. If your gut instinct is to say never, then listen to me instead. I believe in you and challenge you not to give up hope. When I made my decision to stay with Yes Theory, I had no idea what would really be on the other side. All I knew was that these guys felt like they really saw me for the person I aspired to be. Amar's role was definitely to be the, the dreamer. Any dream that you think is too crazy, he'll level it up and make it even crazier and be like, nah, that's not big enough. My hopes for the future are huge because I stand on the giants that came before me. I want to build the first decentralized city and skydive over the pyramids of Giza. I want to grow a community that outlives Thomas, Matt, and I. And yes, someday I want to go to pilgrimage with my dad. My hopes and dreams are a reflection of both who I am now and who I plan to become. So are yours. And in times like right now, where there's so much collective uncertainty, hope may be the only thing we have going for us. So for our challenge this week, I want you to choose a future calendar date. A date where you can pinpoint something to look forward to. Maybe it's signing up for an online class to explore an interest. Maybe it's planning a weekend road trip. Schedule something that will move you towards the vision for the life you hold in your heart that sometimes feels too far off into the future to entertain. Share your plans with us on Instagram by tagging Yes Theory and using the hashtag Yes Theory Challenge. And until that date, hold out hope. Fall through with what you promised yourself and then continue pursuing your wildest dreams. I am your host for this episode, I'm Mark and Deal, but I would not be here without my friends, Matt Daher and Thomas Bragg. This episode was produced by Joy Folks and Juliette Luini. It was edited by Joey Fishground. Dan Kroll sound designed and mixed it right up. The S3 podcast is produced by Kate Ward for One Day Entertainment. The executive producers are Leah Sutherland, Morgan Selzer, and Sam Rogaway from Headspace Studios. <laughs>